important because usually, first of all, usually if in a practical game uh, we reach that position, usually we are in time trouble. Yeah, so we don't really have time like in the opening and middle game. So those uh, knowledge are pretty important. Of course, secondly, the rook and games are the most common. So if uh, after the opening or in the middle game, the, the game doesn't finish, usually we reach something end game. So let me show you the first one. It will be some uh, easier, but uh, it will be more complicated also. Let me share my screen. And all right. And I show immediately the position. Okay, this is one of the most, uh, most basic one. This name is the famous Philidor position. As I'm sure many of you immediately know what is the, uh, the right move here. If black to play, rook b6, excellent. I can see in the, on the chat you immediately write many good moves. A wonderful rook b6, great. What is the point of rook b6? Uh, the black rook uh, preventing the penetration of the king on the sixth rank. So white's plan basically would like something king f6 followed by pawn e6 and threatening to checkmate on the back rank of the black position. But why rook b6 is good in that? Because if the, the white king cannot go ahead, cannot go forward, and if he push the pawn with e6, then the rook goes back to b1 exactly, and now what happened? The white king cannot hide behind the pawn. So compared to that position, if we start to give checks here, the white king can come to e6 and uh, the black is in a tough trouble. Threatening the checkmate, no check on the sixth rank. Rook a8 check will come. So let me show a few moves. Check, king, for example, g7, king e7. And this is already a winning position for white. Uh, that's why I don't continue this, because later we will have many similar, uh, many similar and completely same position also like this. So that's why rook b6, e6, and rook b1. Then we go back. Now the white king cannot hide in front of his pawn, and uh, black will just keeping many, many checks, and the position is drawish. Okay, so this is the most, most basic, one of the most basic one, which very good to know, because if you know it, it's, it's very easily you can, you can uh, hold the position. Let's see the next one. Next one will be the same, but uh, what about if Y to play here? This is already more uh, complex, more complicated, because uh, this will be also draw, but not so easy already, like the Philidor type of defense with uh, rook b6. Of course, if white wants to play for win, he can play king f6, exactly. By the way, in the past, even Philidor also thought that king f6 is winning. But this is still draw, but there is only one good move which uh, can hold the position. Let's see what would be that. What is the only move? The only move is rook e1. Very important to go behind the pawn. Later on, the, the second defense method in Philidor's position was discovered. Uh, an attack from the rare uh, that helps black to hold uh, as well. If the rook fails to occupy the sixth rank, a la Philidor, it must be placed in the rare of the white pawn. But okay, let's see what about instead of that, because the weak moves, we all, so if you study end games, especially rook end games, it's very important. For example, if you read a book 
very important to study the bad moves also, otherwise it's not possible to understand. So if we just would see the main line, only the good moves, it's not possible to understand very clearly. Moreover, uh, that is also an important uh, reason, because for example, what happening if you reach this position with white, you play king f6 and your opponent doesn't know rook e1. You can win the game. In practically many times it can uh, it can come out. Let's see, for example, what about rook f1 check if he gives a check? Okay, king e6 is still natural. King f8 go out of the checkmate. But now what? Now how to continue? Because if the king uh, moves, the white king moves to the d file, then the black will black rook always go to the d file, give check, and the king has to escape. So of course we give a rook a8 check, king g7, and king e7. Now we already have a nice square on uh, on e7 and uh, ready to push the pawn. Of course, if the rook, black rook gives a check on uh, f7, that is no problem because king d6 and then the pawn can move forward. Easy winning. So rook d1, still he tries to go side and give the checks from uh, side way. But this is already too late. e6, check. King d6, rook b6 check, king d7. Slowly we go uh, near to the black rook, check, and finally king c6. And now we can see that black is losing because, for example, if the rook goes to e7, then king d6 followed by e7. And, uh, and uh, there is no enough, uh, enough checking distance exactly. Bravo. So let's go back and see the rook e1. What is the different right now? The different is that, okay, uh, king e6, yeah, because, okay, e6 is not a point because check and we are uh, reaching the Philidor position, just perpetual checks. If uh, rook a8 check, then king d7 and no e6 check because the rook and king is also controlling that. So king e6 is the only uh, attempt to, uh, to, to try something. And okay, now what do you think, what would be the right way? Uh, go to d8 or f8 with the king? If you know the most important principles, which is also an important one, uh, then very easily you can decide in this type of position. Um, very important, the king is going to the short side. The king should go to the short side, while the rook should go to the long side, because there we can give, the, we have chances to give many, many checks. If it is opposite, the king goes to the long side, which is the long side, this one. And this is the short side, because from the pawn, we can see that. Uh, if the king goes to the long side, the rook won't have enough space on the on the short side for sure. Okay, exactly, very good. So king f8. Uh, yeah, this is the correct, but at this moment it's very important to uh, to say that even king d8 would be also hold the position. Okay, so if if somebody doesn't know and play here. Even this is also okay because check king c7. If king f6, then king d7. And in case of rook e8, rook e8 is the typical move. Why rook e8? Protect the e5 and prepares for king f7. Yes, it's compared to the king f6. The king on f7 is fine because after king d7, we can push the pawn, e6, and just go ahead. But rook h1, so the black rooks, rook also go to side. Yeah, in case of rook e2, then uh, that will would be already too slow because king f7 
And now rook h2 is already, already slow. Uh, but okay, for example, if king d7, then e6, and king d6, for example, check, and e7, and the pawn go, goes forward and uh, we will promote it. And in case of uh, rook f2 check, then we can come to e7 with the king, and the pawn is also unstoppable. Okay, rook h2 still try on the side. Now this is still a tricky, tricky position, because if white would play e6 too early, then rook h7 check and still black can hold the position. So like e6, rook h7, king, for example, g6 or anywhere, and rook goes back to h1, and white cannot uh, improve the position. Why? If he push the pawn, then king d7, just next, we go next to that, and, uh, and he lose the pawn. On the other hand, uh, we will come king d6, and uh, black can keep very easily. The black king is too near uh, to the pawn, and it's, uh, it's not possible to improve with white. So if we go back to this position, so we cannot uh, hurry with e6. So we have to play rook g8, very important, only winning move, because the rook would like to cover uh, his king on the g file. So if check, then he can just block it. Rook h8, now still another important move. If he would push the pawn, also king d6, e7, king d7, and this is a drawish position again. Why? Because the king and rook uh, control the e8 square very well, so he cannot promote it, uh, and, uh, and, he, and the white rook is very passive, so if he tries to improve, just check and take the pawn, except uh, king f8, because then check again. Uh, always be careful with this rook e7, uh, rook d1 check, and black loses the rook. Okay, so rook h8 check. And okay, if even king g7, we can play anything, maybe rook e8, or go to the h file, and black doesn't have any problem at all. He can keep the position. Okay, so... Um, that's why this e6, uh, e6 wasn't a good move. So we have to be very uh, careful until the end. King e7, very, very nice move. We stop his king yet. And, uh, and okay, the rook on g7 is covering the seventh rank. So no check from the black rook. And we are ready to play e6 now. Black can just stand. He doesn't have any improvement push the pawn, and if the pawn reached the sixth rank, it's time to, to improve the rook already. Let's see why is it, it is winning. For example, black continue with the same plans, like give a check on h7, then um, actually we can go anywhere. Maybe f8 is the most precise. King d6, and the point is e7 now. The idea is same like before, rook e7, Rook d1 check, and we will win the black rook. Or if he maybe gives a check, then king g7, rook e8, and king f6. Very important to come here. Compared to king f7, then the black rook can take the pawn for check. But now after taking rook d1, and we win the e7 rook. Okay, so this is the reason why after rook g1, we are uh, winning here. All right, uh, let's go back to the rook e8 position. So we were talking about king d8, rook e8, check, king c7, uh, rook e8, and rook h1. Very important to come here. And if rook g8, then rook e1 also goes back. Don't start to give the checks because king f7 and... Uh, the rook will block on the g file and, and uh, push the e pawn. So very important to come back here. And now white cannot really improve in the position. If king f6, then king d7 again. And if the rook and king can uh, control the 
250 square, usually that is a good drawish chancing chances. And for example, if rook g2, then the king can already go back. King d8 and and uh, black can hold without any problem. So even this king d8 is also possible, but after that, the black has to be um, precise enough. Let's see king f8. King f8 will be much easier. Rook a8 check, king g7. Now we can uh, evaluate the position of the black rook first. It uh, prevents both uh, king e7, king d7. Secondly, uh, black can meet uh, king d6, king f7. If he tries with rook e8 again, then rook e1, and we can see the rook is in the very long side. So now it's even that chance he also doesn't have, like in the rook h1 mirror position. Because uh, now there are, there is also another important principle in the rook and games. If uh, there are three squares between the rook and the pawn, one, two, three, yes, between the rook, let me do it in yellow, and the pawn, that is draw. Very easily draw because it, it's, uh, it's much enough space for the, for the rook. And in case of king d6, then king, simply king f7, rook a7, check king, f, king e8, king e6, king f8, and we reach the same position. Okay, so this is the, this is the point of if uh, why to play in the Philidor position, okay, it's even also possible to hold, but we have to be very precise with rook e1. Awesome, let me show you the next position. Yes, this is the next one. Another very, very important and basic. This is called the Lucena position when, uh, yes, we are building a bridge. It's very, very important. Uh, that's why I said this is very basic because uh, in all position when the pole reached the seventh rank, the king is in front of that, I mean the own king. Then with this method, with this we can win always without any problem. Okay, so here also there are few type of uh, winning, and uh, but if you know the main one, that will be uh, very very useful. I'm sure many of you already heard about the fourth rank uh, factor here. How to do that? First of all, rook g1 check. That's why I said this is not the only one, because, for example, rook e1, rook d1, those are also winnings, but in not every position. So it's good if you know here, here this is in any cases, the black rook can be in any other places, also, we have the same winning with check, king h7. The king cannot go to f6 because king f8 and then uh, promote the pawn. So king h7, and now we go to the fourth rank with the rook and open the bridge. But why we, why we need to build a bridge? If we immediately come out with the king, then rook f2 check, king e6. Check, king f6, rook f2, and we cannot come because the rook will give uh, many checks. Okay, so the method is called building a bridge or sim simply bridging. Okay, so this, this is how we will, we will say it. Rook g4 exclamation mark. Okay, maybe rook d2, black can just stand. And let's see what is the different. King f7, check. King e6, rook e2 check, king f6, rook f2, king e5, rook e2, and rook e4, and we just block and promote the pawn. That's why it was uh, very important to cut uh, the black king with one more file in the beginning, 
because if you see the last position, the king would be on the G file, black can exchange the rooks, followed by king F7. And he just uh, yeah, grabbed the pawn. So here he is too, too far for, from that. What about if he doesn't give another check, if he just keep himself with rook e1? No problem, rook g5 and rook e5 will come and we reach the same. Uh, yeah, many people ask why not rook g5 immediately, which seems to be faster. Actually, this is also okay, just uh, he has an extra king h6 and we have to lose a tempo. That's why the fourth, fourth rank is the best and and uh, here there is no any complication at all. It's very easily we can win this. Okay, so this is the Lucena position, one of the most important one. Later we will see uh, similar positions when uh, black to play uh, with a different rook position. But uh, that's why we will always see black to play because if if it, if white to play, it's very easily he can win with this uh, bridging method. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see the next one. What about this position? This will be uh, just a little bit different. Little, little bit different. Okay. What about if the pawn reached the seventh rank like in the previous one, but the white rook is in front of that and uh, the white king is far. This is a very tricky position, but also a very elementary one. Uh, yeah, the point is that this is a very, very easy draw if black knows how to, to hold the position. For example, let's say king e4, the white king starts to go there. And that is very important. The black king can be only on g7 or h7 in these two squares. Why? Because if the king starts to go toward the, towards the pawn, for example, king f6, then he can give a check immediately and then promote the pawn. So here he cannot go. But what about if he goes to the seventh rank? like king f7 and try to be really quick, this is a decisive mistake as rook h8. So the rook goes here, threatening to promote the pawn. And in case of rook takes a7, rook h7 and we win the opponent rook. Yes, q or wins the rook, exactly. So the king can, black king can just stand on g7 and h7, and the rook has to just pass on the a file. Also, he cannot uh, leave the a file because if he goes somewhere else, then the white rook can move and promote the pawn. But very easily he can hold, for example, rook a2, king d5. The white rook cannot move, so it's... Uh, he doesn't have any other plan like come with the king. We are just waiting. And okay, maybe here, or we can wait for king b6 when the white king protects the pawn. We can just give checks and uh, the white king cannot hide at all. So that's why I say, if you know this, you, doesn't, you, you don't uh, want to come with your king. We just keep uh, with cool blooded on the A file. It's very easy to, to hold the position with black. Okay, let's see the following position. If I put a pawn on G2, what happening now? Also white to play. So white has an extra G pawn. It is still a draw because nothing changed start to push, that keeps himself, and nothing happened. The king can also go, and the, the rook is, is just moving. So everything is same like before. That pawn doesn't make any sense at all. It would be the same with the h pawn, by the way, also. So if this pawn would be on h2, also the same h for h5, h6, the king goes to h7, and, and it, this is fine. 
But what about if white has an F pawn? Is it something different? With F pawn, we are winning exactly because white doesn't have any other uh, thing, just push the pawn. F5, rook a2, f6. And the king has to leave the g and uh, h files, otherwise the pawn uh, promoting. King f7, and then rook h8, and we reach the same winning position. OK, so if f pawn, uh, of course, in e, d, c, those all winning very easily, just the g and h are uh, drawn yet. Okay, so this is a this is a very uh, how to say very very obvious when the white pawn is is on the a seven the rook is very passive that's why. Okay, let's see the next one. What happening if white is a little bit more tricky and uh, doesn't push the pawn? until the seventh rank. Why he keeps his pawn on a6? Because he would like to hide with his king on a7. Yeah, so if the king goes to b6, rook check, king a7, and then his rook can come out. So this is the only chance how can uh, he play for win. We will see this is also a theoretical end game, so we will have many, many um, ways here, many, many theoretical positions also. But I can recommend you if you are, you are a pawn up, like in this position, and if you are white, push your pawn only until the sixth rank, and because it's much harder to keep the position, like on the seventh rank. Exactly. This is the Vancouver position. This name is the Vancouver position, uh, because Vancouver defense is that how white can keep the position. But let's see what is that which black should do here. This is still a drawish position, but much harder than the previous one. Let's see, for example, what about if uh, king f7? King f7 is still possible. Yes, because uh, if a7, then the king goes back very quickly to g7, and then uh, we reach the previous position. So why doesn't have it with that? He would like to play king e4. And now king e7 would be a blunder, because now a7. So you can remember that in the Vancouver position, the e-file is the minding square already. So if the king goes there, then already a7, and he cannot reach properly the pawn or the other side. He's just in a wrong square. If king d7, then rook h8, if king f7 also. And OK, this is already a losing position. So uh, if he doesn't blunder this, it's, it's also lost because the white king is too, too near. But we will see this in the following position. Yeah, if, if rook a5, then uh, yeah, king d4, and the king is very far. So basically, if we reach this position, this is already this is already winning for uh, white. Let's see how. Rook b8, king b7, the king goes to a8 also, and a7. And the black king uh, fails to reach c7 in time. Yeah, so, for example, if he goes somewhere like d7, then we can already come out. But we also will have uh, similar examples. OK, so that's why king f7 was uh, not good in the beginning. Let's see the correct move, rook f1 check, king e4, and rook f6, exclamation mark. This is the so-called Vancouver position. Black follows the same pawn in uh, crosshairs method found in the endings with uh, bishops 
of uh, opposite colored. The rook attacks the pawn in order to prevent the enemy's uh, prevent the enemy's rook uh, from leaving a8. So we attack from the side. What can white do? If uh, he plays a7, black will play rook a6 behind the pawn. And uh, if the king comes near the pawn, then we start to give the checks. So let's see, for example, king d5, rook b6, king c5, rook f6. This is the best place of the rook. So that's why we attack with side, because also the white rook cannot come out. And when the queen protects, then check. And now we start to give the checks. But why should we change the rook position from a1 to f6 to attack the pawn? The difference is very easy. Uh, the king can, the white king cannot hide on a7 because uh, rook f7 check. And uh, we also can give a check on the seventh rank. Yes, and, and this is just a7 and rook a6 and, and uh, black can keep. Okay, so if you know this, it's also not hard. If, uh, if the white king is still not so advanced. Check and go to the sixth rank. Okay, still, still this is uh, very clear. But let's see the next one. The next will be the Romanovsky position. And this is already much more complicated. Let's see why. This is still a drawish position. Yes, still a drawish position. Um, if you see the, the yellow squares, it is showing that theoretically, if the white king on those squares, on the yellow squares, and uh, every other piece is the same, actually the rook should be on, I don't know why it is going there. So in this position should, should see this, uh, uh, yellow squares, this uh, drawing zone. So if the rook is on a1 and the king on those squares, this is drawish, this is draw. But of course, not so easy. Not so easy to hold with black this position. There are two type of draws like now, two ways, but let's see one by one. What about if we would like to use the, immediately the Vancura? defense. Rook f1 check. Compared to the previous position, the king is on f4 instead of f3. And we can immediately see the different. The king can go to e5. And in case of uh, rook f6, black, uh, white has a nice uh, winning move with rook g8. Yeah, it's a smart uh, solution of of the position of the winning because the black rook is hanging on f6. Yeah, king f7, rook f8 check, and we can force to exchange the queen, exchange the rooks, and then the queen will uh, come on the a file. Okay, so this doesn't come by tempo. What about if black uh, would like, just without tempo, like rook b1 and prepares for rook b6? This is the critical point always with white also, if the rook goes somewhere and threatening to go to the sixth rank. Because now he also has to be really careful. Because for example, if he just continue with king e5, then he can play rook b6. And it doesn't matter the white king is more active like in the previously. It's also draw because, uh, because the rook cannot come. So it's, it's a very obvious, like in previously, just give uh, checks from side if, uh, if the king tries to go near. So what can white do? If he, if he push the pawn, then uh, the rook goes back to a1 behind the pawn and it's also draw. Rook a7 check, very important move. Uh, rook b1 is already a losing move. So rook a7 check here. And uh, king g6. Yeah, still, this is the best we will see later also, because if king f6, then white can play king e4. 
And the black's problem is that if the king is on f6, he is not threatening with rook b6, because rook h7. Yes, he can come here by tempo, rook a6, rook h6, check and win the rook. And if king g6, then, uh, then a7. And it's, uh, it's easy winning. Yes, the rook could come out, the viking is fast, so he's losing right now. And what about if he tries to come with king e6? Now the king is on the minding square on the e file. Okay, our rook is also not on a8 yet, but the black rook also not on a1. So now we can go to rook a8, and this is winning immediately. As the black king comes, then a7, threatening with the something rook move. Yeah, the same, same winning motif. And also, if, if rook a1 also too slow because a7, and then, uh, then we reach the winning position. Okay, so king f6, uh, king f6 is losing, that's why very easily. King g6 is still uh, better, but rook b7, rook a1, and now we have to be careful. Uh, the pawn is hanging, and if a7, the obvious move could have been met by king f6. And uh, the white king also cannot come. And now the black king can go, because the white rook is not in front of the pawn. So he can, uh, he can come without any problem. King e4, king e6, king d4, king d6, and, and just, uh, just go that way. So that's why here we play a very smart continuation, rook b6 check, king f7, and king e5. And uh, white, is, white is winning. Because threatening with rook b7 check and pawn a7. So for example, if the king comes, then check, the, he has to go to the eighth rank and then a7. And, Rook b8 coming and, and uh, promote the pawn. Okay, so rook b1, the one of the most natural movies losing. There are two ways which uh, reach the draw. One of that is rook c1, and another is rook a5. But let's see one by one why it is good. If rook c1, let's see what is the different compared to the previous one, compared to the rook b1 position. Rook a7 check, king g6, the only good move. Yes, we already discussed if king f6, it's bad because king e4, and the rook, rook c6 is not a threat because first of all, maybe I this a tempo, and then rook h7 will come and, and uh, a7. So king g6, rook b7. And now we can see the different uh, in previously, the rook was on b1. And if the rook was on b1, then this rook b7 was a tempo. So he should he, he had to play rook a1. But now there is a nice extra possibility. You know, in the past, before these uh, strong computers like Nalimov and Tablebase uh, came out, they thought that uh, king f6 is the draw because the king comes and uh, and he can uh, grab the pawn. But now coming the real surprise, rook b6 check, this king f6 is a losing move also. And in case of, okay, if king f7, then king e5, very quickly we can come here and rook b7, a7, and white is winning. And if king e7, then we will have a very nice winning uh, maneuver. A7 first of all, rook A1, and rook H6. What is the point of that? If he takes, we win the rook with rook H7. And in case of he just uh, come with the king, rook H8. So with this uh, amazing rook maneuver, white can, uh, white can win the game. And it's all because of the king f6 move. 
Yeah, so this is very important to cut him on the fifth rank, rook c5. This extra possibility we have uh, compared to the rook b1 position, and uh, and black can hold the position with this. But let's see how. King e4. Of course, if a7, rook a5, that is drawish because the kings uh, are coming quickly. And the rook and the king e4 is transposing to the rook a5 position. So let's see in that move order if he plays rook a5 in the, in the first move. It will be transposition. King e4, rook b5, rook c5 is also good because if king d4, then rook c6. And in case of rook a7 check, then king g6, rook b7, and rook a5 goes back. Why rook b7? Otherwise, rook c6, and, and uh, we have the same easy draw position. Rook b7 and rook a5, and we reach the rook b5 position. So there are some transpositions here. Rook b5, rook a7, and also king g6, very, very important. Okay, we already discussed why not king f6. Rook b7, also only move because king d4, rook b6, king c5, rook c6, reach the same Vancura defense. So rook b7, rook a5, a7. If you are white and you want to be tricky, still you can try rook a7 because uh, king f6, for example, that is losing as rook a8 and the king cannot come more near and the white king is already in the winning zone. So he has to play rook b5 or rook c5 to reach the, the drawish position. But okay, let's see, theoretically a7 and if the pawn is on a7 and the rook is protecting from, from side, from the seventh rank, then the black can also come with the king, king f6, king d4, king e6, king c4, king d6, king b4. And okay, king c6 is the easiest way. The king is too near and is draw, but even rook a1 is also okay, because if king b5, then we give the checks on b1. And if he goes to the a file, then we can give the check also there. Awesome. It was already much more complicated. Yeah, the, the, the Vancura was uh, easy, but every position is based on that. So we, we always try to go side that. Okay, so all is based on that, but they, this was already much more complicated. Let's see the following one. This will be also a different one. How about this position? If the pawn is on the sixth rank and uh, the black is in front of that, in, oppos in the opposition, and the black rook is defending on the eighth rank, this name, we call that this is the passive defense with black. Let's see when the passive defense possible and when uh, it is not. When uh, white has, or the attacking side has bishop pawn, yeah, so f or c, or uh, on middle pawn, D or E, that is winning. Yes, this is again the knight pawn. We will see it. the next example will be that. Uh, the passive defense is uh, working on the knight pawn. With the knight pawn, it's, it, it's possible to hold the position, but with the bishop, it's not. Let's see why. Rook b7. Excellent. Rook c8. And now coming the nice move. Rook g7 check. Our plan actually is rook a7 and then push f7 and uh, rook h8 and, and win the game. But uh, after this, he has rook c6 yet. And we are just uh, have to repeat the moves. So rook g7 check. Let's see what is the different. King f8, rook h7, king g8, and push the pawn f7, and, and win the game. Yes. 
So, wie der Bishop Pawn und wie Central Pawns, the passive defense doesn't work. Loses by this motif. Let's see what about with the Knight Pawn. Why it is working? Why it is working right now? Because Rook B7, he just keep himself. Now there is no any special check. King H8, check King G8. Yes, and he doesn't have an extra rook move there. And G7 is even losing for white because check on C6 and, and take the rook. So he has to be even careful because it's even possible to lose also if he's not so careful. Okay, so, so in this, it, the passive defense is, is a possibility. But how about if white has two pawns? on the G file. Here, the passive defense doesn't help. Why? Because, yeah, it is win, it is winning, but let's see how. We should somehow, how can we imagine uh, we can win this? Because if he goes to H7 with the rook, then G5, let's imagine that rook H7, then pawn, okay, let me play here. G5. Okay, first of all, I can come here if I want. But okay, if I just keep myself like rook a8 is also good because g7, check g6, rook takes g6. And this is just a stalemate. Okay. Uh, so this is not a winning, uh, winning method. What would be the mini winning method? We can imagine that we should play a g7 and we should go with the rook to f8. Check, uh, rook has to take, take king h7, and then we can advance the g pawn. But how can we reach that? Of course, the immediate g7 is not working because rook a6 check. Yes, we exchange a rook for a pawn, exactly. The g5 also doesn't work because he keeps himself and also the, the same um, stalemate motif will come. Proof g6 and, and uh, it's no possible to win. So first of all, we should go to the sixth rank with the rook to protect our king, rook f8. This is a tricky move because if we would play g7, we would go to the same problem. Rook f6 check and uh, he has to, yes, double exclamation mark and it's uh, also still made here. So g5 first. We are waiting for that the rook still goes somewhere like rook a8. The rook cannot leave the eight rank, yes, because if rook b8 and checkmate. So he has to play the passive defense, g7, Rook c8, and then rook f6, followed by rook f8, and uh, we have the same winning position, right? Like, right, this check, rook takes, pawn takes, and king h7, and we will uh, advance the pawn right uh, now. Okay, excellent. So, um, yeah, these were the, those examples which I uh, wanted to show you uh, today. And uh, I hope it was uh, interesting and you could learn a lot from this because, uh, because these are many, many times this can uh, come out. So it's, it's good if you know this type of, uh, this type of very basic rook end games. Uh, that's also, also important to study uh, practical rook end games also, but the first always should be the theoretical, otherwise uh, the after the simplifying you won't be uh, familiar. Uh, this is this exchange is good or not, but if you know the basic ones, that is already a huge advantage and your uh, self-confident will be also much better. Okay, all right. So okay. I stop my sharing. So it was interesting, and I have a few questions for you from 
uh, let's say our participants. Uh, first one is who is your favorite chess grandmaster and why? <laughs> Yeah, it's a very good question. And many times I, <laughs> I get uh, this uh, question. Uh, at this moment, I can, uh, I can mention Richard Rapport. First of all, because uh, I am the second of him and also a good friend of him. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's actually a great, very, very creative player. I'm sure you heard about uh, he qualified to the candidates tournament himself, which will uh, going on uh, on June or end of June, something like that. And uh, but of course, uh, I can I can say many other. Maybe he is the favorite now, but uh, yeah, when I was younger, my favorite was you. Favorite was Gary Kasparov. Uh, I played many, many similar openings like him, or uh, I can also mention that he played many op similar openings like me. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, actually, with his aggressive style and uh, very nice theoretical uh, knowledge always uh, impressed me. But of course, nowadays, if I can say, of course, Carson is, is uh, definitely the, mm, the best player. So, so his play is also always uh, impress me. Okay, thanks. And second question is, I'm taking one-on-one -on -one lessons twice every week with the nurture coach who is FIDA master. I'm 1300 rated and 16 years old. How can I gain 400 rating points in the next four, uh, 12 months? I'm planning to play eight over the board tournaments during that period. Uh huh. Yes, yes. This is also a good question. Yeah, actually, always that is the main question for everybody. How can, how can improve? Yes, doesn't matter from which rating where. Uh, I can always recommend, especially in the, that level, uh, if you if you every day you should make uh, many many puzzles because then your brain is always working and. Uh, and during the game, you will also see the combination positions more, uh, how to say, more precisely or more, more easier. So uh, that, and also many, if you play many, many practical games, nowadays this is not so hard because uh, on many websites you can play, uh, you can play that. So nowadays in online is also possible that. And of course, uh, build an opening repertoire is, is also really helpful because then you, you always have a way which you, can, which you can follow, how you can improve there. And of course, the best would be that if you do this with a coach. Nowadays, without a coach, it's, it's not really easy because it, it takes so many time. But if, if you have a good coach who can help to guide in this uh, these ways that uh, that's that's very very helpful. Oh, you almost answered the next question. I'm thinking of going for one on one training with nurture coaches, but I'm getting a lot of group sessions for free already with grandmasters on nurture. Is one on one training uh, advisable? Uh, yeah, of course. It not means that you know it's not possible to compare to the group ses sessions with the with the, the the personal one yeah the one by one because uh, both of them are very very good but if you have a personal one then uh, then an individual one then he can help he can help you uh, exact you so for example you can analyze your games together even which you play online he can help to create a repertoire for you so that you cannot learn from a, from a group session. Group session is very, very useful. So it's very, very good. But that's why I say it's not possible to compare them. So if you have a, an own coach also, that is the best. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question is, how can I improve my calculation? Yes, many, many puzzles as I mentioned before. So many, many puzzles are, are the most, most, most important. And 
also um, there are many many good calculation examples which uh, also the best if you do with a coach because the best calculation examples uh, you cannot do yourself because usually very long and your coach can help you uh, okay this is good let's stop here and continue to think from here in your mind usually yes so that is if if you get something helping that that can be much more useful puzzles are you are very very good which you can see books or websites or anywhere that's completely okay but the harder calculations which is more deep uh, that's not really easy to do alone okay can you recommend any books for decision making um, yeah actually combination books you can find many many I like the block book, the something combination motifs, the name of that. Uh, but there are many, many. I remember when I was young, I also did uh, many, many, many this type of chess books. So in, you just go to the, the internet and make it and find immediately a lot. So com combination is the easiest, which you can you can find everywhere. Endgame book is already not so easy. Then I can recommend the Dvoretsky Endgame Manual uh, book. That's, uh, that's good enough. Okay. And the last question is, how do I decide which opening I should play? <laughs> yes. Also a good question. Actually, yeah, every, every opening is good. Uh, and I can also say that a good coach can help and guide you that. Uh, but okay, if you do this yourself or with coach or anything, the most important, try to play those type of openings, which is very uh, near to your style. Yeah? So for example, if you are an attacking chess player, because you like to attack, like the combinations, tactics, it's good if you play open systems, like main Sicilians, so if you play yeah, aggressive, uh, aggressive system, if you doesn't uh, feel so comfortable yourself in that, then it's better to play more solid, close, closer systems. Of course, it's not possible every time just reach those type of position because the chest is very complex. So in many openings uh, uh, can be how to say, uh, go to... Um, solid way so if you want to play sharp but your opponent really want to avoid that he can but usually then you you won't have in in any danger so it's everything is uh is uh has advantage and disadvantage also but mostly for example let's say if you play an open sicilian mostly you will have a sharp positions for from that much more than from a close Sicilian, for example. Okay, so this is the, the, the reason why it's good if you, if you play those type of, which is comfortable, suitable for you and near to your style. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Christian. It was nice explanation and answers. Thank you uh, so much also. And also, I would like uh, to thank uh, all our users for joining. And uh, I hope that uh, all of you will stay safe and take care until the next session we will have. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for the night. nice uh, host, Alexandra. And thank you for everybody to watch it today. So see you then.